Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is America's role in the world. I've been analyzing the insidious way in which haters of the United States and, by extension, Israel, are now cooperating to topple the most powerful Western nation in the world, the United States. It is an exclusive club. Its members are united in their effort to oust the hegemony of the United States of America. And because it is so exclusive, and because most of the world is not paying attention, they might just achieve their goal, minimally. In the meantime, this club is causing tremendous damage to the United States' interests around the world. The club, as of now, is restricted to a quartet of nations. Member nations are China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Russia. Each nation is bent on hurting the United States, each determined to undermine U.S. interest, each and every one of them usurping power from the United States in the international arena. The worst part is not that this quartet is colluding against the U.S., the most powerful nation in the world. The worst part is that the most powerful nation in the world is not responding, not acting to protect its own interests. Need proof? Here's an example. China has just finished a deal no one would have thought possible five years ago. They have successfully brought together Iran and Saudi Arabia. Embassies are opening, full diplomatic relations will be in place, trade and other exchanges have already begun, ambassadors have switched, they're already in their positions. These two countries, Iran and Saudi Arabia, represent an antithesis, in the classic sense of the word, Hegelian. They are polar opposites on so very, very many different levels. Each sees the other as heretics, not as apostates, but total rejectionists of Islam. Each sees the other as having adopted an improper, untrue version of Islam. Saudi Arabia leads the Sunni world, and Iran leads the Shiite world. Almost never before in history have the twain met. These are not small differences in nuance, not at all like Catholics and Protestants. This is about 1,300 years of brutal battle over the essence of Islam. In addition, Saudi Arabia is ruled by an authoritarian monarchy. Iran is run by extreme religious ayatollahs. Each despises the other's form of government, and yet China has united successfully these two nations. The reason why China was so successful was that they all agree on one goal. They all agree to join forces to create a bulwark against the West. Read the United States and Israel. Simply understood, the West means the United States and Israel and their allies. That's what unites this club. That is the engine that powers this club. That is the big snub. Adding Russia to the mix makes the club even more dangerous. Russia, not like Iran, is a pariah in the world today. Now a new nexus of trade has been created. And some of that four-way, four-partnered trade will most certainly be in violation of the international sanctions slapped on both Iran and Russia. China needs oil, and they will get it from Iran and from the Saudis. Russia needs weapons, especially drones, missiles, and rockets. And they will get those from Iran and from China. In a particularly dastardly move, Saudi Arabia just decreased their daily oil production. That single move immediately increased the price of oil on the world market. It increased the price of Brent oil, that's a measurement, by $5 per barrel, from $80 to $85 per barrel. This move will dramatically increase the price of gas at the pump. Prices will continue to climb throughout the summer. The Saudis have announced that the reduction of output will continue through year's end. That is bad news. Oil output is normally determined in an agreement with the large OPEC group. It would defeat the purpose of the cartel of OPEC if each member, especially the largest member, Saudi Arabia, breaks rank from the rest of the OPEC cartel. Loyalty to the group and enforcement of output quotas is the power by which OPEC controls, or at least heavily influences, the price of oil in the world. But this reduction in output was decided by Saudi Arabia independent of OPEC. 
None of this bodes well for freedom-loving countries like the United States and Israel. And the one country that has been the champion of freedom, the protector of our freedoms, is now allowing itself to be minimalized and bamboozled. Wake up, America. Wake up before it's too late. Coming up next, points of view. First up is a column from the Jerusalem Post. It's a column written by Tova Lazaroff and was published on April 23rd, 2023. And it's entitled, Has Netanyahu Divorced Himself from U.S. Jury? Analysis. In her column, she has an aim. It's to point out some of the serious damage that has been done by the move towards Israeli judicial reform, a move that was championed by Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. This is how she begins. Netanyahu just dislikes American Jews, says former Israel Council General in New York, Alon Pincus. If Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's goal was to sever the already frayed cord between Israel and the United States jury, then so far he is doing an excellent job. There is nothing that speaks to the disconnect between his government and the largest Jewish diaspora community than Netanyahu's decision Sunday to cancel his participation in the Jewish Federation of North America's annual convention known as the General Assembly, which this year is meeting in Tel Aviv. It's considered to be the most consequential gathering of North American Jewish leadership. The delegation to Israel this year numbered 3,000, representing 74 Jewish communities in the United States and Canada. These are the people that advocate for Israel in their communities and within the American government considered to be Israel's most strategic and strongest ally. They lead solidarity missions, they raise money, hundreds of millions of dollars for humanitarian and emergency projects in Israel, particularly in times of war. When one looks across North America to see who loves Israel and the Jewish people, then this is one of the most significant leadership groups working 24 seven to foster the bond that strengthens both their own communities and Israel, and helps them flourish. Now Lazarov proceeds to explain what Netanyahu should have or could have done instead, and the message that is sent when the leader of Israel backs out of a commitment, at a time-honored commitment, that is, to speak to the leaders of diaspora jury. She asserts that Netanyahu simply does not like those American Jewish leaders because they mostly vote Democrat, and they revile his Likud political perspective and the philosophy of the moderate right in Israel. In fact, she maintains, Netanyahu is deliberately slapping them, Jewish leadership in the diaspora, in the face. This is how she puts it. Lazarov writes, there is a more sinister speculation that this is simply payback by Netanyahu for American Jewish community's refusal to support his reform plan and the impact of that stance on the Biden administration. The cancellation of his speech comes just one month after U.S. President Joe Biden said he would not invite Netanyahu to the White House in the near term, citing his opposition to the government's judicial reform plan and referencing American Jewish opposition to it. Just days before the JFNA convention, Netanyahu indicated he would send the very right-wing Likud minister May Golan, infamously known for his statements against African migrants and refugees, to serve as Israel's Council General in New York. It was a move seen by some as a slap in the face to the mostly liberal and democratic American Jews. It now appears that Netanyahu has since backed away from that step. Now Lazarov references American-born Michael Oren, former Israeli ambassador to the United States, and she writes, Oren said that Netanyahu cannot afford to alienate U.S. Jews. As Israel faces a looming confrontation with Iran, the support of American Jewry represents a strategic asset to our security. Everything must be done to preserve that asset. Lazarov now concludes by writing that this tension between Netanyahu and America is not new. It dates back to the Obama administration. And this is how the column concludes. Netanyahu's tension with the U.S. jury is not recent and dates back to his former tenure as prime minister during both the Obama and Trump administrations. 
leaving American Jewry increasingly questioning the necessity of their ties with Israel. The push for judicial reform has only stressed the relationship even further. At a time when U.S. Jews are asking the question of why Israel should matter, Netanyahu is giving them the message that he does not care, with a stinging slap in the face. At a time when the Israeli Prime Minister most needs to heal the Israeli bond with U.S. Jewry, Netanyahu's decision to ignore the GA when it arrives at his doorstep has given the impression that while he might value the U.S. when it comes to the country's jury, he would like a divorce. Lazarov has articulated a point of view that she shares with a lot of other people, but it's really important and a very good insight in terms of understanding what's going on today. Next up is a column penned by Art Green that was published on April 20th, 2023 in the Times of Israel. Green is a creative, thoughtful, and insightful thinker who created a new Hebrew college rabbinical school in Boston. Green has recently retired from his position. He, his great love, by the way, is Rebbe Nachman of Bratzlav. This piece is directed at U.S. Jewish leaders who came to Israel for the GA, for the General Assembly. He focuses on their attitudes towards Israel and Netanyahu. It's entitled, To the Leaders of American Jewry at the General Assembly. Subtitled, We U.S. Jews allowed ourselves to be silenced on Israeli issues, but we were wrong. Israel needs our strong moral voice. This is how Art Green begins his column. Welcome to Israel. It's a wonderful that you have come here now during these turbulent times. You will have a chance to encounter faces of Israel you have never seen before, both good and bad, as I have witnessed them in the course of the past four months of my own visit here. You will see the tremendous strength of Israel's civil society and its treasuring of freedom and democratic values. Those are the Jewish values at their best, as we American Jews understand them. Fairness under the law, protection of minorities, identifying with the oppressed, freedom of speech and expression. You will see an Israeli populace awakened from the slumber of indifference, realizing for the first time in many years how deeply committed it is to all that's best about this wonderful country and all it has accomplished. But you may also be forced to look into the face of the worst of Israel, a growing distortion of Judaism that sees Jews as superior to others, as lone masters and overlords in a land in which others live as well, as entitled to privilege over non-Jewish citizens of the state. Make no mistake, the campaign against the Israeli Supreme Court is being led by extremists in the Jewish-Palestinian conflict that have roiled this beautiful land for the past hundred years. Their goal is annex the West Bank while denying citizenship to its Arab population. Within Israel, it is only the Supreme Court, the great bastion of human rights, that stands in their way. The hope of the extreme right is to make the lives of Palestinians, first in the West Bank and then in Israel as well, so miserable that any who can will choose to depart, leaving a powerless and weakened minority. They need the Supreme Court out of the way in order to do this. In conclusion, Green explains that Jewish leaders attending the General Assembly have power, real power. Moreover, he points out that they cannot be easily ignored. He writes, your arrival here in this moment of great awakening in Israel is an opportunity to help set things straight. Ask tough questions of your Israeli interlocutors. Don't accept easy answers. Let them know what we American Jews have learned about the importance of an independent judiciary and the protection of minority rights. Where would we be without these? As one who has spent his life training future American Jewish leaders, I call on you to explain to the Israeli leadership how vital these values are to the current younger generations of American Jews. If we are to remain one Jewish people, it must be shared truths and values that hold us together, not just memories of shared past and fear of our enemies. The current Israeli leadership does not listen to rabbis or professors, but you, the assembled leadership of American Jewry, are a body 
whom it cannot easily ignore. It is time to take a stand. Israel needs you to do so. Here we have another valuable point of view from Art Green. While I do not agree with everything that was written there, I absolutely think that it is essential that American Jewish leaders speak up and speak out and explain why they are so upset by what is transpiring in Israel today. Coming up next, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. I want to show you seven cartoons, memes, and headlines today. First up is a, the very classic of stories that never really happens, but what a wonderful world we would be living in if it happened every once in a while. Here's the dialogue. Flight attendant. Is there a doctor on the plane? Me? Yes, but not that kind of. Flight attendant says, the pilots are debating the merits of the terminologies of the Dark Ages versus Late Antiquities versus Early Middle Ages. Me? Okay, I'm here. <laughs> that's one that just makes me smile. Imagine if that's the kind of doctor they needed on the plane. Next is a headline from the Sacramento Bee. It reads, facial recognition program mistakes 26 California lawmakers for criminals. My hilarious comment on this headline is only 26 lawmakers. Now another headline. This headline is so typical that it's hard to believe that it wasn't made up. But it's true. Anyone who has ever encountered the mud in Ukraine will recognize it immediately. The headline reads, Russian armored recovery vehicle gets stuck recovering stuck armored vehicle. <laughs> That's funny. The mud is awful in Ukraine. The next cartoon is, uh, it put a smile on my face. It's a seagull talking to another seagull, telling the story of his travails. The first seagull says, so I swooped down and I grabbed the bag off the towel, fended off five other gulls, only to find out that it was a bag of kale chips. The second gull says, that's the worst. Keeping with that theme, the theme of kale, of course, this next meme is also about kale. Kale is one of the hottest foods around, and honestly, and I have to be honest here, I'm not a big fan. <laughs> the meme reads, I miss the 90s when bread was still good for you and nobody knew what kale was. It just appeared. Who knows? Quite frankly, good, fresh, crusty bread is far more my style. Next is a perfect play on an imperfect language, which we are subjected to all around us all the time. A person in the bagel shop places her order. She says, I'd like to buy a bagel with cream cheese. The counter guy says, sorry, we only take cash. I like that guy. Making fun of the misuse of the language. This last meme is a 50s, 1950s homemaker cooking and reading a recipe. She says, this does not make sense. Add leftover wine. What the H is leftover wine? In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. Addressing the Jewish Federations of North American Conference, celebrating Israel's 75th Independence Day, President Itzhak Herzog, a consummate diplomat, spoke on the hot button issues of the day. He discussed the ongoing legal reform talks, describing them as honest heart-to-heart -heart talks. He expressed his aspiration for a future constitution, acknowledging the challenge and complexity of the tasks, saying he does not live in a state of delusion. In his remarks, Herzog also emphasized the importance of dialogue with distant Jewish friends, calling for efforts to deepen the relationship between them. Herzog has embraced his role of Israeli president with style and with class and with panache. Amon, the official Jordanian news agency, reported that Israel is holding a Jordanian parliamentarian after he was arrested for suspicion of trying to smuggle gold and weapons through the Alamee border crossing to the West Bank. The weapons, we are told, were on the floor of his car. According to the Jordanian report, the suspect was trying to smuggle close to 200 pistols and assault rifles, including 15 M16s and AK-47s. You can actually see the Twitter videos 
of the collection. The Ben Gurion Airport website shut down following a cyber attack by a group of hackers called Anonymous Sudan. This cyber attack against Israel's national airport comes only shortly after the Israel Electric Corporation website shut down due to a cyber attack against their company. Cyber attackers are becoming more and more bold and more and more successful in their efforts. Germany has appointed an eight-person commission to reappraise and investigate the Palestinian terror attack on Israeli athletes and team members at the 1972 Munich Olympics. The commission is tasked with answering unresolved questions about the heinous attack. According to this statement released by German Interior Minister Nancy Pfizer, quote, for too many years, there was a lack of understanding or reappraisal of the event's transparency about them or acceptance of responsibility for them, unquote. It's taken a long time for us to get answers. Hopefully the commission members will unearth the whole story and make it public for us to understand what really happened on that terrible, terrible day. When Israeli Foreign Minister Eli Cohen opened the country's permanent embassy in Turkmenistan, he declared that the move will strengthen Israel's position in Central Asia. In the first visit by an Israeli top diplomat since 1994, Foreign Minister Cohen met with Turkmen President Sedar Bedramakadadov, commenting in Twitter, Cohen wrote, ties with Turkmenistan have a great importance for security and diplomacy, and the visit will strengthen Israel's place in the region." Unquote. Opening this permanent diplomatic mission in the capital of Ashgabat, about 25 kilometers, at 16 miles, from the Iranian border, gives Israel its third embassy in former Central Asia, the stands, I call it. The others are in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Turkmenistan, which holds vast natural gas resources, maintains a firmly neutral foreign policy. It has remained largely isolated under autocratic rulers since reaching independence after the 1991 collapse of the former Soviet Union. Iran has announced that their navy forced a U.S. submarine to surface as it entered the Gulf. The announcement was made by Iranian Navy commander Sharam Irani, who spoke to Iranian state television. But the United States Navy's Fifth Fleet has denied that the incident has taken place at all. According to Irani's statement, I'm quoting here from the statement, the U.S. submarine was approaching while submerged, but the Iranian submarine, Fateh, detected it and carried out maneuvers to force it to surface as it went through the Strait of Hormuz. It had also entered into our territorial waters. It corrected its course after being warned. This submarine was doing its best, using all its capacities to pass in total silence and without being detected. We will certainly reflect to international bodies the fact that it had violated our border." Unquote. When the U.S. Navy's Fifth Fleet, based in Bahrain, denied what it called Iranian disinformation, Commander Timothy Hawkins spoke to Reuters and said, quote, a U.S. submarine has not tra transited the Strait of Hormuz today or recently, unquote. Israel is in advanced negotiations with Germany to sell its Arrow 3 missile defense system. Israel's defense ministry said, Germany has ramped up its military spending, a decision prompted by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Arrow 3 is designed to intercept ballistic missiles outside the Earth's atmosphere. The Arrow 3 is the top layer of Israel's missile defense array in series of layers, which extends from the Iron Dome, which is the lowest level, intercepting short-range low rockets, to the Arrow 3's long-range missiles that they destroy at any non-conventional warheads at a safe altitude. According to Israel's defense ministry, talks with the German ministry have been accelerated and the aim is to export the system in the near future. Central Elections Committee Chairman in Israel, Supreme Court Justice Noam Solberg, announced that the 26 Knesset elections in Israel will be held on October 27, 2026. This announcement comes after Attorney General Gali Barav Meira 
said back in March that the election should not take place in 27, despite the fact that less than four years will have passed since the elections for the 25th Knesset. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that the world is a better place today because 75 years ago the Jewish State of Israel was created? Israeli Independence Day is a Jewish holiday, and we celebrate it using the Hebrew calendar, the fifth of Iyar, Hey Iyar. Our parents, or grandparents, or even you, if you were alive 75 years ago, could never have envisioned the Israel of today. Israel boasts more than 9.3 million citizens. There are 17,000 families named cats in Israel today. There are also an estimated over 2 million stray cats in Israel today. Our parents and grandparents were amazed that Israel was able to celebrate one year of anniversary, and then 10, and then 20. And here we are, proudly celebrating the 75th birthday. The Israel of 1948 has barely any resemblance to Israel in 2023. Israel is no longer about an issue of survival. Israel today is about creativity and productivity. Israel is organic. It's growing. And with that growth comes mistakes. But that is not a failure. It's an opportunity to correct, to fine tune, to move on and to continue to grow and to flourish. I look at Israel as a laboratory, as an experiment where the researchers, in this case Israel's citizens and Israel's leaders, tweak the experiment in order to reach an even better result, to make Israel a better place for us as Jews, for the world, which can count on Israel as a solid member of the free and democratic nations of the world. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS.